So I'm going to tell you a little story about how you can use all the leftover bits to make food. And watch me. Meat and bone. Now, who would still eat this? Jamie Oliver has an interesting relationship with chicken nuggets, and it's something I find deeply fascinating because it's this weird convergence of both an extremely political rhetoric and one man's personal pride. It's a conflict that has led the man to take on chicken nuggets in some form in every show he's made, to flex over them and display superiority right down to basically lying, like in the 2011 miniseries Jamie's Dream School, where he promises a room full of troubled teens that he can teach them to make nuggets better, cheaper, and faster than frozen nuggets. And this is £1.90. It's 10 pence cheaper. I'm going to do it in half the amount of time. And this is, do you think this is better for you or that? No, I don't know. All the way back in 2005 on the show Jamie's School Dinners, Jamie demonstrated the contents and production of chicken nuggets for a group of children, which is, as with a lot of food, kind of gross. These are the kids that won't eat my chicken. You know, these are the kids that want their, 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 their nuggets back. So I want to show them what's in their fucking nuggets. Then what they do is they add more chicken skin. That is how that part is made. At the end, he asks if any of the kids still want nuggets, and all of them decline. Any, anyone want one of these? No. Oh, no. In 2010, on the show Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution, the production recreated the scenario with kids from Huntington, West Virginia, but this time when Jamie asks if they still want the nuggets after learning how they're made, all the kids say yes. Now, who would still eat this? They all want those nugs. And who can blame them? Chicken nuggets are delicious. This bit is one of those clips that's in a sort of perpetual virality. Every few months it makes the rounds again, with a new caption, new commentary, and new conclusion for the audience to draw, and it's one that fascinates me because Jamie's argument against chicken nuggets is just so comically bad. There's a lot of possible arguments against chicken nuggets, a lot of reasons you can consider chicken nuggets to be bad, and Jamie is making none of them. For example, you can argue that chicken nuggets are a product of a corrupt industry that is often deeply inhumane towards the animals that pass through it, making it immoral to enjoy the products of that inhumanity. Or you can argue that eating meat is intrinsically immoral, that we have, for the most part, moved past the need to get sustenance at the expense of animals. You can argue that the meat industry is exploitative of its workers at the mundane end merely engaging in aggressive anti-union practices and predatory hiring of migrant workers who can then be threatened with punitive use of the immigration system, and at the extreme end, buying slaves from Christian drug rehab programs. But Jamie's argument against chicken nuggets is that they're bad because they're made from the bad parts of the bird, arguing that there are the good, clean parts of the chicken that are appropriate to eat, and the rest of the bird, which is garbage. Take this bit, for example, which uses the grammar of television to suggest that even the kids see this plainly obvious fact. Now, chicken wings are worth quite a lot of money. I showed them where all the nice cuts of meat came off the chicken. So we just pop the legs off and then you're left with a carcass with all the ribs and the little bits of giblets and blood and skin and stuff like that. What do you think happens to this? They get thrown away. He'll have people sniff store-bought chicken nuggets and ask weird leading questions like, doesn't this smell dirty? But then no one ever responds because it probably just smells like a chicken nugget. Now smell your nugget and then smell the other one. Your, your one should sort of smell quite clean. It smells yeah. fresh. And then the other one smells a bit dirty. Jamie makes a lot of hay about mechanically reclaimed meat, and indeed, the entire thrust of his scare presentation with these kids revolves around the fact that the middle parts of the process, where they take the bad, dirty parts of the bird and process it into food, are kind of gross looking. The process involves taking the parts of the carcass that aren't prime cuts of meat, parts that still have a lot of good muscle tissue attached, a lot of connective tissue and gristle, which aren't very tasty but contain collagen and elastin, which breaks down into useful amino acids, 
leftover skin removed from cuts that are sold skinless, organs and bone marrow, grinding that into a paste, straining out larger solids, then using the resulting meat goo as an ingredient in food like chicken nuggets. And you know what? I will concede this fact. The stuff looks gross. I would not pipe tepid meat goo into my mouth. This does not make me hungry. But so what? Lots of food looks gross when it's raw or partially cooked. We literally have a popular phrase about the making of sausage for this exact reason. If your requirement is that food look delicious and appealing at all stages of preparation, then I'm sorry, that's really a you problem. So like I said, there's a lot of reasons to criticize the food industry, the meat industry above all, but what you can't really argue about the meat industry, and chicken nuggets in specific, is that they're wasteful. And this is something of a complexity of the issue. They definitely use all of the bird. Now, make no mistake, this frugality is in no way motivated by an ideological aversion to waste, but rather stems from maximizing the return on their product. Literally anything left over at the end of the process, they're going to try to find someone to sell it to. Mineral solids contain keratin and calcium, so dry it out, grind it up, and mix it with fertilizer. Organ proteins are used in pet food. Various soft proteins, fats, hair, hide, feathers, and other byproducts can be rendered into glycerin, gelatin, oils, lubricants, and pastes, which are used in food, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, and industrial applications. It is notoriously difficult to go truly 100% vegan because products often contain other products that are themselves made in part with animal products, which is complicated because if you're going to accept that it's okay to eat animals and use animal products, which at the moment is the mainstream opinion in our society, then clearly if you're going to use the bird at all, you should use the whole bird. Now, while pink goo isn't the apocalyptic nutrient void that Jamie Oliver wants to paint it as, it is undeniably the lower quality stuff. I don't want to mislead you into thinking that frozen nuggets are something that they aren't. They're not great, but you already knew that. But like, it's not sawdust, it's still food. After taking the prime cuts off a bird, there's a lot of second-rate but usable nutrients left on and in the bones. This is why it was customary in ye olden days that after you ate all the easy parts off a roast chicken, you'd boil the scraps and bones to pull out whatever was left and create chicken stock. At least that's what you'd do if you're too poor to just buy another chicken. If you can't afford to not extract every last calorie, out of the bird you bought. Now, I don't want to suggest that Jamie Oliver is classist. I don't know the secrets that lay in the inner cloisters of his heart, but these arguments definitely are. Oliver isn't arguing against nuggets because of what they contain or because they tie into complicated questions of morality and the ethics of eating meat, or even entirely because of their actual nutritional value. More on that later, but because of what they represent, which is a low-class diet. This is the language being evoked, the implication that low-class people are dirty and thus cheap and dirty are synonymous. There's bits on it that are worth lots of money. The breasts are the most expensive part. It's the biggest and it's the white meat, okay? The other thing that I want to talk about briefly is the rhetorical function of this clip. Something fascinating about it is that from the point of view of the production, from the messaging viewpoint, there really isn't a wrong answer to Jamie's offer of nuggets. Meaning that no matter what answer the kids give, I, as the conceptual author of the show, can use it. I can use the whole bird. If the kids reject the processed nuggets, they validate the assertion that nuggets aren't just low-quality cheap food made from leftovers, but are dirty and inedible. If the kids still want the nuggets, even knowing that before being cooked they were a pink slime, then that validates Jamie's superiority, the assertion that America is doomed, that the kids are broken, that there is a spiritual epidemic. And that is exactly how it's employed in the actual episode. 
I mean, what's scary is that we've brainwashed our kids so brilliantly, so even though they know something is disgusting and gross, they'll still eat it if it's in that friendly little shape. As a fascinating extension, the clip, as it makes its rounds through mimetic cycles, alternates how it's being employed based on what community it's passing through. It is shared in equal measure by people laughing at Jamie Oliver getting dunked on by some kids who want them saucy nugs, and people who agree with Jamie that this reflects a metaphysical illness in society, which is the source of the physical illness of obesity. Now this argument is stupid, but it's also extremely popular. There is a pervasive belief in our society that poorness is a moral failing that the poor inflict on themselves, that the disastrous and growing class divides in the world are the result of a type of person who just loves chicken nuggets so much that they're not willing to stop being poor. Of course, that's all extremely wrong. The real answers are far more complex. School lunches suck because there's no money for quality ingredients. The staff are often poorly trained, if not unqualified, because there's no money for training or hiring qualified personnel. There's no money for hiring qualified personnel because of a belief that school lunch lady is a meaningless trivial job where you slop food at children and not a position where you're expected to serve food to several hundred people in a mere 45 minutes. The logistics don't magically get easier just because the patrons aren't old enough to buy cigarettes. There's no money for quality food because there's no political will to allocate that money and there's no political will because of all sorts of messed up priorities, including the belief that poorness is a self-inflicted problem. Why, that sounds like a vicious cycle, doesn't it? You could address this complexity, and in fairness, Jamie Oliver hasn't strictly ignored this, even as he's drafted lunch menus that would drain an entire year's budget in a month, but it's a lot easier to look at chicken nuggets as a thing that just happens to be in proximity to the problem and blame it for everything. Back to Jamie's dream school, Oliver promises that he can make nuggets cheaper, faster, and better than the store-bought nuggets, and it ends up exposing a lot of the charade. And this is £1.90, it's 10 pence cheaper, I'm gonna do it in half the amount of time, and this is, do you think this is better for you, or that? No, I don't know. Now, to a degree, he's not strictly lying. If you have a very well laid out kitchen, all the ingredients, a familiarity with the recipe, and confidence in your tools and technique, then measuring from the moment you start to when you start eating, you can probably make fried chicken strips faster than an oven can heat up a box of tenders. And the recipe he gives here, I mean, it's lightly seasoned fried chicken. Probably tastier than most nuggets as long as you make it right. And you know what? It might even cost you less by weight than the most expensive box of chicken in the grocery. More than twice as much as the cheap box, though. Just for the chicken breast, not including the other ingredients. Also, this isn't really that much healthier. It's still got plenty of salt, it's still fried in oil, but also healthy versus unhealthy is really a terrible way of conceptualizing food in the first place. This is actually a persistent problem with Oliver's version of healthy eating, which really isn't driven by actual nutritional value. He still uses a lot of sugar and salt, but is better conceptualized again as clean versus dirty. Things with lots of listed ingredients are bad, things with fewer ingredients are good, regardless of what those are. Don't taste that good, Talk out loud, out loud, out loud. 3, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 40. 44! Okay. <laughs> How many ingredients in there, guys? So he's not lying, but the whole exercise requires so many caveats and so much deck stacking that it is disingenuous. It's just an extension of the argument that poorness is the result of things like food choices, rather than food choices being largely dictated by being poor. I mean, one, you're probably not buying the $16 box, you're buying the $7 box, and you're not coming home and heating up $2 worth of mechanically reclaimed chicken strips because everything else in your life is going great. The biggest hole in all of it, of course, is the issue of time. With the stacked deck, the linear time is about comparable, but what's not comparable at all is the actual amount 
of work. I mean, it it's so self-evident that I, I feel insane even pointing it out. Jamie's fried chicken bites are good, but you spend the entire time making fried chicken. Plus, it generates a huge amount of mess that you will then need to clean up. Food prep is extremely time and energy intensive, and it's maddening that so much of the hay about healthy eating relies on pretending that it's not. So the whole thing is an argument that displays such a fundamental lack of understanding about why people eat what they do, and it's a dangerous argument because, again, it's a popular argument, and it's popular with the kind of people who write and pass laws. Seemingly every day there's another proposal for a law to heavily tax unhealthy food or arbitrarily remove things like soda, french fries, and chicken nuggets from the already asinine list of things food assistance can and can't be spent on. Food is an almost unfathomably complex subject, and there are very real issues of public health and ecology tied up in it. People, broadly, eat what they have access to, and access is dictated by class, and class in our society is so very often dictated by race. It's about free time, stress, how far away you live from a grocery store, whether or not you live in a neighborhood where the freshest vegetable is the lettuce in a Big Mac. It connects to problems with jobs, wages, the physical design of our cities, the priorities of our politicians, and the incentives of our economic system. It's a big, intensely complex problem, which is why it's ultimately a lot easier to just be a stooge, to go on TV and blame the audience for having bad taste. Like, no, you're making the nuggets wrong. You're making dirty nuggets. Stop making dirty nuggets. Sucking on my tennis like you wanted me. Sucking on my tennis like you need the meat. Sucking on my tennis brings you big delight. Sucking on my tennis, all my 